guests and friends. Today is the second talk of a seminar series in pediatric immunology, and my present duty is to welcome you all. Today, we are very happy and proud to have Dr. Helen Lackman, a doyen in the pediatric immunology, in this Zoom meeting. On behalf of everyone present in, the, in this gathering, and on behalf of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, a warm and hearty welcome to you, Madam Dr. Helen. Welcome, Dr. Helen. Thank you very much. I am very honoured by the invitation, particularly since that you should all be here on Diwali, which seems to me to be uh, okay. very, very okay. different. Okay. Okay. Dr. Dr. Jagrishan. Welcome, yeah. all my respected teachers and colleagues. I know several office bearers of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, both national and state leaders are here, including our state president, Dr. M. Narayanan. But to save time, I I am not calling anyone for a comment. I'm directly calling Dr. M.P. Jayakrishnan. He's the additional professor of pediatrics in government, also pediatric intensivist at Government Medical College, Calicut, at Institute of Maternal and Child Health, to introduce the speaker. Dr. Jayakrishnan, out to you. Thank you, Dr. Hey, good evening, friends. This week in the seminars in pediatric immunology series, we have two very exciting topics. One is hyper IgD syndrome, and the other one is CNF receptor associated periodic syndrome. And to talk to us on the subject today, we have Professor Helen J. Lackman, senior consultant and professor at Royal Free Hospital, University of London. Uh, professor Lackman has done extensive work in the field of autoinflammatory disorders and also on systemic amyloidosis, both the hereditary and uh, acquired forms of systemic amyloidosis she's interested in. And uh, her work um, is uh, actually she, her uh, work is predominantly focused on clinical aspects of this disorder, specifically including phenotypic uh, characteristics and also on novel therapeutics on this, of this rare disorders. And uh, she has published widely uh, with more than 500 publications to her credit and um, uh, with her vast experience in the area, she's the right person to talk to us today uh, on auto inflammatory syndrome. I invite Professor Lackman to deliver her talk. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk today about traps and mavalonic kinase deficiency, and it's going to be quite a clinical talk. Uh, and I apologize in advance, I'm an adult physician, um, so I will try and keep it a bit pediatric. So the autoinflammatory diseases, as you know, are disorders of innate immunity. Uh, and the classic ones that we started with are monogenetic diseases. Um, caused by mutations affecting the innate immune responses and characterized by sterile inflammation. And they have really over the past 25 years now taken us on the most remarkable journey of reverse translational medicine. And they have been the most beautiful examples of learning from our patients and have been responsible for really the explosion of interest in innate immunity in the understanding of the importance of the innate immune system, and in particular, in the key roles played by pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly in the role played by interleukin-1, and in the quite magical story, both of the happy coming together of the ability to diagnose these diseases genetically, with the ability to block some of these cytokines with modern biologics, and with the extraordinary discovery that blockade is highly effective and also remarkably safe meaning that we've gone from diseases that were extremely rare, extremely difficult to diagnose and essentially untreatable to these diseases now being extremely high premium diagnoses, which are really worth making because they are essentially treatable. And if diagnosed early, these patients can be salvaged and we can now talk to them about really expecting to have a normal life uh, in almost all respects. So we're now talking about normal life expectancy, but also an expectancy of a normal life experience. And for an adult position, that also means I talk about a normal expectancy of fertility uh, and of employment and of turning out autonomous, normally functioning adults uh, expecting to have normal employment and everything else. Uh, and having sort of done very well with the IL-1 driven diseases, there's now great excitement as this field moves on to look at other factors of innate immunity and other pathways uh, in which again, rare patients have proved to be uniquely informative. 
So this has all been very driven by patients. And one of the problems with patients is that you have to diagnose them. And diagnosis of these diseases has been remarkably challenging and relies on clinicians and relies on a high index of suspicion. And this has been shown in when we look at these patients in their diagnostic delays. And as an adult physician, we still regularly see patients who have been undiagnosed for 40 or 50 years before they get to us. But with recent advances, we've seen a dramatic fall in the diagnostic delay. And we now do expect that most patients are picked up by the pediatricians, particularly by pediatric immunologists or rheumatologists and our large registries, and there's clearly a bias in that the experienced centers recruit into registries and they are the centers who diagnose young, are seeing a considerable fall in, dying, in the delay to diagnosis. Uh, and this is entirely driven by clinical recognition. So what does a suspicious patient look like? So we're interested in patients with a history of recurrent or continuous symptoms of fever Practicing in Northern Europe, I'm very interested in rash, but characteristically, the rashes that we see in the periodic fever syndromes are pale, are evanescent, are not itchy, and are easy to miss, and are particularly easy to miss against a dark skin. So I don't think that you have to weigh them very heavily in their absence. They're useful in their presence, uh, but the absence of rash wouldn't put me against a diagnosis. Serositis is common. In older children and adults, we see joint pain and myalgia and arthralgia very commonly, but arthritis is rare. Symptoms are always in innate immunity accompanied by a markedly elevated acute phase response. Uh, and in older practice, I always point out that I do not run a chronic fatigue or a fibromyalgia clinic, and that there is always dramatic inflammation accompanying these symptoms. A family history is useful, but 50% of the diseases we deal with are recessive, and we tend to have rather small kindreds with no relevant family history. And even in the dominant diseases, variable penetrance is well recognized. And fewer than 60% of patients will give a clear cut family history of another family member being affected. Onset is usually early, anywhere between the neonatal period to infancy. But some diseases present late and up to 10% of patients will report their first symptoms after the age of 40. Even if you push them very hard, they are quite clear that they didn't manifest until well into adult life. And these are often diagnoses of exclusion and what is excluded very much depends on your background diseases. So in adults, we're looking at excluding connective tissue disease and malignancy, but in adults, uh, but in children, infection, immunodeficiency are very much more present in the differential diagnosis. As I've said, these have become very high premium diagnoses because these are diseases where we're looking to change the long term outcomes. And what we're now talking to our patients and their families about is that we're looking to achieve a long term outcome in these rare diseases of a normal or a near normal life experience. That is turning out autonomous adults who are physically independent and capable of running their own lives with completed education and normal employment opportunities. We also want them to be able to have a normal family life uh, and to have the options of having children and to have confidence in their long term health outcomes. And this 20 years ago sounded like fantasy when we were actually talking about up to 60 percent of our patients dying young. But now is very much what we're looking for. And with early treatment, what we are hoping that we're going to completely evolve is damage. And the damage that particularly occurs in autoinflammatory disease is physical with bone and joint deformity, growth retardation, central nervous system damage often associated with inflammation, but sometimes perhaps with metabolic consequences, and AA amyloidosis particularly resulting in death from renal failure. Uh, there's also a degree of cognition and developmental damage, which may in part be related to chronic disease. And there's considerable psychosocial impact on both the patient and their family from long term untreated inflammatory diseases. And we know that these children who are chronically ill have tended to have very poor educational outcomes and therefore economic outcomes. Uh, and also that our uh, long term poor outcomes in terms of treatment tends to result in problems with chronic pain and fatigue later in life, which we also think uh, is amenable to early treatment, resulting in an improved quality of life over time. So these are diseases where there is a high risk of poor outcomes if we miss them and a hope of really very good outcomes if we pick them up early. And this all centers therefore on diagnosis and on picking these patients up early. 
So moving on to uh, why do we want to pick them up? We want to pick them up because we can treat them. And I'm going to call, talk on, come on to talk about treatment specifically. But when we're looking at these diseases, we're looking at a unique group of diseases where we're talking about lifelong treatment starting young. And what we want for our treatment is effective therapies which control their short term symptoms, prevent development of long term complications, which we can use lifelong. So from earliest childhood through development, through pregnancy and in older ages, drugs which are well tolerated, have minimal drug interactions which are licensed and therefore we can fund, which are affordable, which permit vaccinations, uh, and which if we can permit pregnancy. And I'll talk a bit as we go through this about how well we're achieving that with our current treatment options. So moving on to the specific diseases. TRAPS, the TNF receptor associated periodic fever syndrome is an autosomal dominant disease which was first described in England in 1982. Uh, and it was described at that time as uh, familial Hibernian fever. Uh, Hibernia was the Latin name for Ireland, and it was because the family was of Irish ancestry. That was probably a mistake. The family, <laughs> probably the mutation, in fact, came from the non-Irish bit of the family. Uh, but it was a joke in referencing familial Mediterranean fever. The name was changed by Dan Kastner in 1999, following identification of the gene responsible for this in his lab by Michael McDermott. And the responsible gene turned out to be the TNF receptor superleaf family 1A gene. Um, and this led to the ability to genetically diagnose this, uh, this disease. What we know now is that the estimated prevalence of this disease is probably about one to two per million. And the largest case series we have from, I'll talk to you about data from this, comes from a European registry, Eurofevers, Eurotraps, where we collected data on the patients really for about three years between 2011 and 2014. And I'll show you some of that data. And some of this is an example of how when you start off doing things, things seem very simple and you get it a bit wrong. So the mutations that cause traps are in the TNF receptor superfamily 1A, and they are largely clustered uh, in the extracellular domain of the protein. And that led to some misunderstandings, which I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, so traps is a rare disease, but it is found worth worldwide. There is a diagnostic bias towards patients of Northwestern European descent. That is probably partly because the first large kindreds were described in families from Northwestern Europe, and there was an assumption it was commoner there, which I think it isn't. And it's partly reflecting access to genetic testing, which was easier in Northwestern Europe and North America. As far as we know, it is, is distributed probably fairly evenly among all known populations. The prevalence is unknown, true prevalence in the UK, our incidence is creeping up. We think our prevalence is now probably rather above three per million, and we're still diagnosing increasing numbers of new cases each year. The Germans have estimated uh, the prevalence to be about 5.6 per 10 to the seven person years. Um, it affects both sexes equally. And as I've said, I think it's um, almost certainly distributed among all populations normally. The Eurofevers project um, looked at baseline demographics. It was a very European biased uh, data set. And I think that needs to be borne in mind when you interpret the results. And it may or may not be more completely applicable to a worldwide population. It's also worth bearing in mind that an entry into the registry, the median age at registry was 32. Uh, and only 30 of the 100 patients who we analyzed were children at the time of entry into the registry, but almost all patients reported onset of symptoms in childhood. So we were getting people to remember and describe symptoms at um, presentation, which might have been decades beforehand. So there's going to be a bit of a recall bias about what they remembered. Uh, so this is a Eurocentric uh, registry, and we are relying on the patients having a bit of recall bias. So it's as good as we've got, but it's not perfect data. When we look at the registry, there were 100 patients with pathogenic variants, and there were 54 patients with a common sequence variant, and I'm going to talk about them separately. Of the patients with clear-cut traps, uh, about two-thirds of them reported a family history, so a third of them don't give a family history. They were almost all Northern European Caucasians. 
and the median age at which they or their family re members recollected their first attack was four, uh, and most of them had attacks lasting more than a week, but a quarter of them had attacks certainly at presentation lasting less than a week. When we went on to look at their genetics and all the patients in the registry had mutation confirmed disease, you can see that the genetics in TRAPS is extremely variable. This is not like FMF. We don't have specific mutations that make the diagnoses. So in these 100 patients, there were 45 different mutations picked up. Sorry, there were 43 different patients picked up in these 100 patients. And 42% of the mutations were specific to a single individual or kindred. Uh, so almost half the mutations exist only in one uh, unrelated in one group of related patients or one individual. Many of these mutations, almost half, affect cysteine residues in the extracellular portion of the TNF receptor. And this was originally thought to be very important because it clearly affects the tertiary structure of the protein. On the other hand, there are an awful lot of cysteine residues in the extracellular portion of the TNF uh, receptor, and it may not be as important as we thought. We have renumbered the um, residues in the TNF receptor superfamily 1A protein in a rather unhelpful fashion in the last two years. So the mutations have all changed names and a mutation that was called T50, T50M is now called T79M, was the most widespread and was seen in five separate unrelated kindreds. In addition to the clear cut traps, there were two very common population variants, one called R92Q, now renamed as R121Q, which was present in one third of the TRAPS patients. And I'm going to talk about that separately because certainly for us, this is an example of a variant of unknown significance, which is very difficult to interpret, but I think it's a separate disease. So I'm actually going to not talk about that in the same group. And I'm going to talk about TRAPS as being non R92Q, R121Q associated disease. So the genetics are complicated and are often family specific, um, and it doesn't make a lot of difference where your mutation is. Uh, as a sort of brief summary of the whole of this registry, we didn't find a clear cut genotype phenotype correlation, and it doesn't matter particularly which residues your mutations affect. It doesn't, uh, you don't have more severe disease with cysteine mutations. The initial thought was that mutations in the TNF receptor, particularly because they affected the cysteine residues, were likely to affect TNF signaling, and that mutations affecting the cysteine residues were likely to result in prolonged signaling of TNF via, its, uh, via the TNF receptor by resulting in impaired cleavage of the TNF receptor, thereby resulting both in prolonged signaling via a trimerized TNF receptor and also by reducing negative feedback by reducing cleavage and therefore release of soluble TNF receptor, which usually competes with bound TNF receptor to downregulate TNF associated signaling. There was some evidence for this originally because some cells are uh, from patients with, with traps display reduced shedding of soluble TNF receptor on stimulation. But this has subsequently been shown not to be true and has been backed up by treatment uh, data, which suggests that blocking TNF isn't particularly helpful in traps. And subsequent data, which I'm not going to go through in the interest of time, suggests that actually the mutant TNF in traps, the mutant TNF receptor, doesn't actually get traffic to the cell surface. It isn't expressed on the cell surface and it isn't involved in TNF reception or in signaling of, um, in the TNF receptor signaling pathway. And in fact, the abnormal protein TNF receptor uh, misfolds and probably the majority of the pro-inflammatory phenotype that is seen in traps is due to a misfolded protein response and an intracellular stress response. And that by a number of different mechanisms, what you're seeing here is intracellular stress responses which seem to result, in fact, in increased production of interleukin-1 beta and decreased apoptosis, and that this is not a signaling mechanism that relies on anti-TNF at all. And this, again, is an example, in fact, of reverse translational medicine, because this occurred really after the clinical observation that blocking TNF in these patients was woefully inadequate, whereas blocking anti-IL-1 in these patients 
produce dramatic treatment responses. So what does a patient with traps look like? As I've said, the majority of them do not present as infants. The typical age of presentation is usually about four. Uh, and disease tends to worsen through early childhood uh, and become worse in adolescence and early adulthood. Most of these patients will present with fairly long attacks. Less than 25% will have attacks lasting less than a week and attacks can last up to three weeks of fever and Abdominal pain without peritonism are uh, accompanied by a number of diffuse rashes, and I'll show you some photographs of them, and diffuse joint and muscle pain, which is generally myalgic without much evidence of either um, serositis or arthritis. It can be accompanied by fasciitis. My personal view is fasciitis is relatively rare but when it does occur, it's very florid and you get very beautiful MRI images. And unfortunately, uh, they're so beautiful that they always get published. And that means that the medical literature contains a number of extremely beautiful pictures, which gives the impression that this is very, very common. Uh, but it's actually extremely rare to see really florid fasciitis, particularly in the older patients. Children can get periorbital edema with it. We don't see it as often in adults. And again, I'd argue slightly that we see periorbital edema in quite a number of kids who are very sick with the auto-inflammatory diseases, and I don't think it's that specific. Intervals between attacks are very variable. They can last from only a few days to months to years. Um, and on the whole, disease worsens as the children get older with more frequent, more severe and longer episodes as they age. So small children often do quite well. They can have a presenting attack uh, and then go often a year or two before they do it again. Uh, but as they get older, the attacks tend to run into each other and become more troublesome. Many attacks are unprovoked. When attacks are provoked, they tend to be provoked by fairly minor stresses. So physical activity, emotional stress, um, Airports for adults are a really good precipitant of a traps attack. By the time you've got your family on holiday, that's usually enough to get a traps attack going for the first week of holiday. Uh, in women, it can be associated with the menstrual cycle. Um, and the attacks are not always the same. So in any individual, they may not have their own, they may not have a typical attack each time. And attacks can be quite vague. So we have a number of patients who really struggle to describe their attack features. Um, and some patients will only present with their constitutional symptoms. So they say they feel a little bit off color, but they really, the only hard symptom that they can describe for us is a day or two of rigors and night sweats. When we compare adults and children, there really wasn't very much difference in the attack features that we see between adults and children. So the real difference between adults and children is the attacks become more continuous and a bit more severe, but the attack features are not particularly different between adults and children. There was a faint suggestion when we looked that serositis, arthritis and constipation might be more common in adults than in children. But I would argue that in general, serositis, arthritis and constipation is more common in adults than in children. And I'm not sure that this is so much uh, disease related is just that uh, as one gets older, uh, you tend to complain more of a bit of joint pain and constipation when you're unwell than in small children. Uh, but in other respects, the disease between adults and children is remarkably similar. I'm afraid these are all adults, but this is a sort of collection of the sort of rashes that you can see with traps. So this is the absolutely classical large plaques of inflammation that you can see in traps. And this is displaying the extremely typical appearance and behavior that you can see with a rash in traps in that this is migratory and it will migrate about half a centimeter an hour overlying the area of maximum pain. So it will take two to three days to move from the trunk down a limb. And by the time it's sort of migrated all the way down, uh, the pain will have eased and they will have areas of maximum pain, both in skin, muscle and joints overlying the area of pain. This is a sort of serpentigenous rash that comes and goes. Uh, and uh, this is a similar rash seen here. And these are rather inflammatory macules uh, that almost look as when they appear. 
um, and this is a rash that in fact healed by bruising um, and that this one doesn't look so bad but a previous episode in that almost looked like erythema nodosum uh, when we caught it right at the end of a attack. And then these are eye signs. So this is an adult, but she's got really quite florid periorbital inflammation going on during an attack here. I do have permission to show these slides. Uh, and here you can see she's got a good going red eye again at the height of an attack. Um, and as a sign of just how tough these patients are, uh, she had a C-reactive protein of about 250 milligrams per liter at this point uh, and a temperature of 40 degrees centigrade and was quite prepared to smile for the camera for me um, and really wasn't uh, making very much of a complaint about her symptoms, which she at this point had about for about 50% of her the time. Trying to improve the diagnosis of TRAPS has resulted in a number of attempts to produce some clinical classification criteria, and these come from Eurofevers. So these were some early attempts at classification and in the presence of confirmatory TRAPS genotype, uh, a diagnosis of TRAPS is supported by at least uh, one of the following, an episode of fever and constitutional upset lasting more than seven days, myalgia, migratory rash, periorbital edema, or a family history, or the presence of a TNF variant of unknown significance in at least two of similar symptoms. Uh, there was a further iteration of this, which was published um, in 2015 with an attempt to produce some clinical classification criteria and a score. Uh, and this is sensitive and specific uh, and uses a number score. And in the presence of attacks or fever accompanied by an elevated acute phase response, which have occurred in a recurrent fashion, periorbital edema, episodes lasting for more than six days, uh, evidence of a migratory rash, if uh, the skin color is felt to be pale enough that a migratory rash counts, otherwise you just take it out of the score, myalgia and a family history, and the absence of vomiting of aphthous or aphthous stomatitis, if the score is more than 43, uh, came out on this, which was a validated um, attempt to produce a score using uh, patients with a variety of periodic fever syndromes uh, came out as a sensitive and specific means of screening for these patients. So once you think you've made a diagnosis of TRAPS, how to treat it? So treatment was historically very difficult um, and we still get very um, caught up in how to treat it. I would say that TRAPS is a remarkably variable disease. And one of the first things to say is that in our practice, seeing patients in whom we're very privileged and we can do next generation testing on everybody and we can do serial blood tests on everybody. So they're quite well worked up. We've done their blood tests. We measure their CRP and their serum amyloid A protein every month. Uh, we do symptom scores on them and we do our uh, quality of life on them. Uh, we, contributed majorly to Eurofevers, and we, this is part of the analysis of the Eurofevers data. I would agree with this, about 15% of patients don't need specific treatment. So about 15% of patients with clear cut traps who are sick enough that they come and you make a diagnosis, have short lived episodic attacks, are happy with a clear explanation of what they've got, are entirely well between attacks, and are happy to manage their attacks symptomatically and non steroidal anti-inflammatories are probably the best management of symptoms. And we manage them purely with non steroidal anti-inflammatories and they haven't needed to have any other treatment. So a number of patients will do well with symptomatic treatment alone, but they do need careful monitoring to make sure that their disease isn't changing and to make sure that they are entirely well between attacks. Almost well, just over 40% of patients in the Eurofevers registry were at any rate initially managed with intermittent corticosteroids alone. And when they're managed with intermittent corticosteroids alone, my personal practice is that we manage them with a big dose. So we manage them with between half a milligram and one milligram per kilogram of steroids. And I start them on that, usually at a milligram per kilogram for five days, and then try and taper very rapidly. So more or less stop abruptly. 
If they can't tolerate that, give them another five days and stop. And we have a contract with all the patients that we won't run them on long-term steroids. So if they can't tolerate stopping the steroids, we say we've learned something and we will move you on to next line treatment, uh, but we don't run them on long-term steroids. I appreciate that that's because we have uh, the ability to move them onto biologics, uh, but a number of these patients have had parents or older relatives who have ended up extremely cushioned on long-term steroids. And there is a risk from these patients that if you don't have something else to move them onto, they can become extremely steroid dependent and do very badly from the steroid side effects. And it has to be said that of the patients who are managed in Eurofevers on long-term, on intermittent steroids, 80% of them eventually required conversion to biologic therapy. So steroids used intermittently are extremely helpful, particularly in children uh, who do tend to run a short course in early childhood of intermittent attacks and being well in between and steroids will terminate an attack. Uh, but if their disease becomes more difficult or the attacks are more frequent, we move them onto maintenance therapy with biologics. Uh, and we do that a decision really of six attacks a year or by calculating their steroid requirement and moving them over for adults when they're requiring more, um, the equivalent of more than seven milligrams um, per day a year is our cutoff for saying that's all you're getting and we're now going to move you onto uh, non-steroid based treatment. There were some patients in Eurofevers who were on maintenance steroids because nothing else had been available to them. Uh, and that was 20% of patients and two thirds of them eventually moved on to biologics. And they are a group who are extremely concerning because they do tend to get the full house of corticosteroid side effects because the doses that they require are extremely large. Patients with traps cannot be held on doses of 10 to 20 milligrams of steroids. You do end up having to leave them on really very substantial doses of steroids. Uh, and this is always accompanied by very significant risks. Of the biologics that have been used in traps, uh, this is now old data, but initially a number of patients got put onto uh, therapeutics directed against the TNF receptor, initially infliximab, and this was really not a good treatment. Uh, this tended to result in prolonged attacks of traps, and we would now regard infliximab and Humira as being pretty much absolutely contraindicated in traps with the risk of precipitating prolonged attacks, mechanism of action that isn't entirely understood but we would not use these agents in traps uh, and would say that they are really a contraindication uh, and that the experience has been that this tends to make matters really quite a lot worse. There is quite a lot of early data, both published in the literature, particularly from the NIH uh, and from our retrospective case series of the use of the Tanercept in traps. And initially, uh, these agents looked quite promising, uh, but very few patients had a complete response. The majority of patients only had a partial response. And even in patients who seemed to have a good response, these responses were not maintained. So the majority of patients only had a transient response at best. And actually, if you follow them up carefully, look at their biochemical inflammation and actually are fairly um, suspicious about their symptoms and really quiz them about it, and the responses aren't very good. And etanercept really went out of favor when it became clear that IL-1 blockade in traps is a very reliable miracle and that these patients when put initially onto anakinra and subsequently on canakinumab do extremely well. And this is data uh, shown here. These are the first 20 patients in London that we put on um, anakinra. And this is data that I borrowed from Marco Gotono showing children treated in Genoa. This for us is the median CRP for the year before we put them on um, and anakinra and the SAA for the year we put them before we put them on anakinra and the year afterwards. And what anakinra has shown in traps is that in patients with sequence variants, there is about a 94% complete response. So complete normalization of the acute phase response, complete clinical response in terms of symptoms. And this is accompanied both in children and adults in a dramatic improvement in quality of life are uh, shown here in adults in the SF36, uh, which is our equivalent of CHAC, uh, with improvement across all domains. And this has been maintained. And our experience has been that we can get everybody off steroids and run them on monotherapy with IL-1 blockade. And subsequent work uh, has really shown this in controlled studies. 
um, with Novartis. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Let me. So I'll come back to this in a moment. So this is just demonstrating that Anakinra, although it's a somewhat difficult drug to use because it's a daily subcutaneous injection and it needs to be kept at a fairly reliable temperature of between two and eight degrees R centigrade and it's not supposed to be shaken. This again is shown with permission. This is one of our patients with traps uh, who we diagnosed as an adult um, and who had really very florid disease uh, with fixed inflammation and we put him onto Anakinra and he then said he was going to do a race to the South Pole uh, six weeks after we put him on Anakinra uh, and that he wasn't going to cancel this race and we tried stopping the Anakinra and he had a major disease flare. So we sent him to the South Pole uh, with the army having produced a kit to keep his Anakinra warm so that it didn't freeze. Um, and this is him injecting his Anakinra whilst racing to the South Pole. And um, they posted a blog and I had no fingernails because this was a 70 day trip uh, with no rescue plan. There is no means of evacuating anybody from the South Pole if they have a major disease flare. Um, and I was extremely worried about this. Uh, but they did this with no difficulty. And although he came back and said it was the worst experience of his life, uh, this had nothing to do with uh, his traps and was all to do with the experience of going by foot to the South Pole. So on treatment, these patients can do the most remarkable things. And having shown really from retrospective data, and this is what the Eurotraps data showed, uh, that Anakinra seemed to be very much the most effective treatment for all these patients. This was subsequently shown in drug studies. And the initial drug study was done in collaboration with Novartis using canakinumab, which is a monoclonal antibody directed against IL-1 beta. And we did an open label study in 20 patients with traps where we allowed them to flare and then we gave them a single injection of canakinumab and then we followed them up uh, and saw how long their treatment duration was, uh, their response duration was, and treated them every four weeks and then allowed them to relapse at the end. And what we showed was that these patients went into a very reliable response uh, with complete normalization of their inflammatory markers, which remained normal whilst they're on canakinumab and complete normalization of their symptoms. Uh, and when we looked at gene expression pathways, what we showed slightly disappointingly um, was that they had really very marked inflammation across almost all neutrophil gene expression pathways and monocyte gene expression pathways uh, when they were treated, before they were treated, and when we, we, they were treated, everything normalized back to healthy controls, um, which was extremely pleasing and went very nicely with their clinical response. Um, but since absolutely everything normalized, it didn't give us a particular gene pathway to go for as being um, particularly useful in monitoring traps uh, because um, everything we monitored fell back into healthy control almost instantly. So in traps in the UK, in summary, our treatment centers, we have, they have to be treated via specialist centers and there are four of them in the UK. And our treatment paradigm is that we treat aiming to produce complete symptom responses and normalization of inflammation between attacks on monitoring of blood. Acute attacks, attacks are treated with non anti-inflammatories. Um, Short-lived attacks on a background of no inflammatory activity are treated with corticosteroids at fairly generous doses. But we know that over time, these tend to show a declining efficacy, dependency and cumulative side effects. We don't favor anti-TNF, which we think is not very efficacious. And we move straight onto anti-R1 agents. Uh, we are at the moment are in the privileged position that NHS England will fund via specialist centers, both anakinra and canakinumab, which is the only agent which is licensed for the treatment of traps by both the European Medicines Association and the FDA. Uh, and we are able to give these for patients who have evidence of chronic disease and we give this continuously, anakin with the patient's self-dose, canakinumab, uh, we have a home delivery system or they come to the center to be treated every four to eight weeks. And this has been associated with extremely good long-term outcomes. And the effect of this has been that in patients who have traps who've been followed up in our center, uh, none have developed AA amyloidosis uh, since we set this service up. So we have seen no patient 
uh, develop a life-threatening complication of traps in the 20 years now that we have been running um, a fever clinic designed to stop this from happening. Uh, this is data taken from the German ProKind initiative, which develops protocols for the management of um, auto-inflammatory diseases in children and is a consensus document and is essentially very similar to what we do in the United Kingdom, uh, but it makes the point about treating to target so that children should be assessed to make sure that you are treating uh, for normalization of symptoms and inflammatory markers. Uh, in continental Europe, they are more enthusiastic than we've been in the UK about on-demand therapy with anakinra and canakinumab. Um, this has been used both in traps and in mavalonic kinase deficiency. I have to confess, I have some doubts about our um, traps where I think most of these patients are too active. And if you stop on demand treatment, they immediately flare. Uh, otherwise, I think it's a regional, reasonable approach, although I have slight concerns, particularly about anakinra, where there is a reported instance of anaphylaxis of about 4%. And I do worry that on-demand therapy uh, may slightly increase the risk of this. I may be biased. The only patient who I did on-demand therapy to uh, did have anaphylaxis. Um, and that put me off slightly uh, when I gave him a test dose and he had full-blown anaphylaxis in front of me. And now I'm just going to talk briefly about the sequence variant in TRAPS, which is um, TNF receptor associated variant, which used to be called R92Q and is now renamed rather unhelpfully as R121Q and is therefore now beginning to appear in the literature under both names. For us in Europe, this is a major problem because it's a common sequence variant with an allele frequency of 1.7%, but this is going to be a problem in all these diseases because what we all see is sequence variants of unknown significance in individuals with diseases which are clearly real, but don't fit in with full-blown pathogenic disease. And so this is the prime example for us. So of patients who are labelled with having TRAPS, 38% of them carry this particular variant, but it's extremely common in our healthy population. When we look at the patients with this variant compared to patients with pathogenic TRAPS, we have two problems. One is the patients with this variant who are entered into registries are quite severe. So the literature is biased towards these very severe patients because they're the ones who are memorable and get put into registries. And therefore, they don't particularly reflect everybody that we see in clinic. And they don't entirely reflect the patients who are published in series of these patients. The general impression is that when we look at patients with this particular subtype of disease, it doesn't look quite like pathogenic traps. The disease is often milder. The episodes are shorter, and particularly in children, the symptoms often resemble PFAPA. So we often see children who have quite a lot of mouth ulcers, cervical adenitis. The disease seems to be biphasic, so we see it quite frequently being picked up in kids, and they often ameliorate with age, and up to 30% of them will uh, have a reduction in fever episodes and 25% of them do seem to spontaneously resolve by the time they come out of childhood. At least 25% of these children will do very well with symptomatic treatment only with NSAIDs. There is a suggestion from the literature that many of these patients will do very well with maintenance treatment with colchicine, which is otherwise entirely ineffective in traps. And intermittent steroids are useful in about half the cases. And in general, the steroids are used at the same sort of dose that we use in PFAPA, which is considerably lower than the dose that we use in traps. We also see a number of adults who have extraordinarily severe disease presenting later with fever. And these patients, unlike pathogenic sequence variant traps, tend not to do very well with anakinra and do very much better with a tamisept, but they need it in combination uh, with steroids. So in terms of clinical symptoms, there's a major overlap with you know, conventional traps, severe pathogenic traps, although it's often a little bit milder. And in children, we think they often grow out of it. Treatment responses are entirely different to severe pathogenic traps. So the treatments we use here, I'm saying the same again, but in kids, we tend to use colchizine. 
uh, if they look like PFAP or steroids. Uh, and in the very severe adults, we use a tamosept, which we would not use in traps otherwise. Um, and this I have borrowed from Eust Frankel. Uh, and this is the advice that he gives in the Netherlands for pediatricians in managing uh, R92Q associated traps. Uh, or at least on 92 q associated auto-inflammatory disease in children, which is a common enough disease that it really is worth having a protocol for the pediatricians, um, and which is entirely different from the protocols we would use in conventional traps. So finishing the traps bit, the summary I'd say is that the phenotype of traps is really quite variable. There is no pathognomonic pattern there are useful classification criteria which can support the diagnosis, but the diagnosis really does rely on genetic testing. Unlike familial Mediterranean fever or a number of other genetic diseases, there isn't a consistent phenotype genotype association, and you can't say that one particular genotype is more severe than any other. The most frequent symptoms are musculoskeletal pain, fever, abdominal pain, and constitutional upset and children and adult ha adults have a very similar disease presentation. R121Q or R92Q disease is probably very different and should be treated entirely differently. And with the availability of modern treatments, uh, I'm going to move on from that. These diseases do remarkably well. So these have converted from being an entirely disastrous disease in the last 20 years to really being diseases with a really extraordinarily good outcome um, and one in which we now really um, have patients who look and feel entirely well on long-term treatment. And then moving to the next disease in the series, which I'm going to be quicker on, mavalonic kinase deficiency is a much rarer disease. So mavalonic kinase disease is probably at least tenfold rarer than traps uh, and is due to mutations in mavalonic kinase which is the gene after HMG reductase in the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway. It does seem to be genuinely commoner in Northwestern Europe, but that's largely because there is a fairly common mutation V377I, which um, is present in the majority of patients who we see, and which occurs in about one in 200 uh, individuals of Northwestern European descent. Um, the theory about why uh, this mutation in this enzyme, which results in about 10% 10, 10 enzyme activity causes an auto-inflammatory disease, is complicated. But the current theory is that this has got nothing to do with cholesterol. So this, this is a failure of flux down the isoprenoid pathway. And what you get is impaired protein prenylation and therefore um, impaired prenylation of rho red GTPases. And this results in decreased um, protein kinase activity and therefore in uh, increased activation of the pyrin inflammasome and therefore increased production of um, IL-1 beta. And this is at least in part a disease again resulting in overproduction of interleukin-1 beta, but via a metabolic pathway. Uh, and this disease results in attacks of severe inflammation accompanied by rash. And I'm showing you pictures of a couple of my patients in the middle of active attacks here. And again, when you look at the patients, uh, cells from patients with these diseases, what you see is evidence of activation of impaired autophagy and reactive oxygen species generation. This is probably quite complex, uh, and exactly what's going on in terms of molecular biology is not entirely clear, uh, and it is a tougher disease to treat than either traps or caps, where the molecular biology has become clearer over time. Clinical features of Babylonic kinase deficiency, unlike TRAPS, is this is the disease that almost always presents in the neonatal period. So almost all patients will genuinely present in the first six months of life, although they may not be diagnosed. And presentation is with fever, with, with fever and constitutional upset, but what is also extremely common during attacks is our uh, cervical and generalized lymphadenopathy, uh, rash, uh, which can be a characteristic macular papular rash, which is really very florid when it occurs, uh, mouth ulcers, GI upset, abdominal adhesions, vomiting and diarrhea. And the experience from our clinic is that more than a third of patients will have been diagnosed with pediatric Crohn's, 
uh, before the correct diagnosis is made. The disease was initially called hyperimmunoglobulin D syndrome, and although the patients do have high levels of IgD, I think a more useful test to be aware of is that their IgA, which is more frequently measured and is much easier to get hold of, is also actually often high. Um, the IgD being high is very nonspecific. Uh, IgA is also quite nonspecific, but it's cheaper and quicker to get a measure on. During attacks, children will have high levels of mevalonic acid in the urine, but this is not present in between attacks. And again, during attacks, these children will have very high levels of inflammation in terms of CRP and SAA. Uh, there is again attempts to make a diagnostic score. I'm showing here again from Eurofevers. This again is both sensitive and specific, relies on an early presentation before the age of two, presence of aphthous stomatitis, lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, painful lymph nodes, uh, and frequent diarrhea in the absence of chest pain as being highly suggestive. Um, but this is a diagnosis which does rely on a high index of suspicion. Long-term complications of HIDS are quite severe. It was initially thought that these children didn't get AA amyloidosis, uh, but over time it's become clear that about 5% of patients will get AA amyloidosis and renal and failure is well recognized. Unlike other auto-inflammatory diseases, there is a high risk of infections and these children do appear to be relatively immunosuppressed. So we worry about bacterial infections. Adhesions can occur, joint contractures can occur. Macrophage activation syndrome can occur, particularly uh, in very severe disease and can be the presenting feature as neonatal mevalonic um, macrophage activation syndrome and is an indication for bone marrow transplantation. Retinitis pigmentosa and angiomyelopomata have been described. It is, I think angiomyelopomata, I think, are probably incidental. The retinitis pigmentosa, it's unclear whether this is another metabolic complication of the enzyme deficiency or whether it's incidental. Um, we've only seen a couple of patients with it and the explanation of whether this is a genuine association or not is still not entirely clear. There are a couple of rather strange features of mavalonic kinase deficiency. One is more than the other auto-inflammatory diseases, this can sometimes ameliorate with age. So there are a number of patients who will genuinely get milder disease as they go through adolescence into young adulthood. We know this from a number of drug studies where we had children and young adults, young adolescents, who we withdrew from therapy in order to recruit them into a drug study. Uh, and they had to flare in order to go into the drug study. And I'd had them on biologics for years. And then when we withdrew them from therapy, they never flared again, showing that they had really got quite a lot milder over time. Uh, and unlike the other diseases, there is also in some of these patients, a degree of mild intellectual impairment, uh, which we don't see in the other diseases. And again, there is no particular explanation at the moment for this, whether this reflects enzyme deficient um, activity or whether if they are picked up earlier and treated earlier, we can prevent this at the moment isn't known. This is not universal. And the majority of patients with HIBS NKD will have extremely good intellectual function, but there's a subgroup of patients who do do quite badly at school, and it's not clear yet whether early treatment will rescue that. Treatment of mavalonic kinase deficiency had been very challenging, and it was the cluster study which looked at the use of canakinumab in colchicine resistant familial Mediterranean fever traps and mavalonic kinase deficiency, which slightly to our surprise showed that IL-1 blockade was really very good in this disease, which has previously proved very difficult to treat. So this was looking at patients receiving uh, 150 milligrams of canakinumab every four weeks for those weighing more than 40 kilograms or two milligrams per kilogram in those weighing less than 40 kilograms. You may feel that 35% of patients achieving their primary endpoint of complete remission isn't very good, but mavalonic kinase deficiency we really hadn't done very well at treating at before, and we thought that primary endpoint looked very promising indeed. And when you looked at patients who had had, let me just move it on to here, dose escalation, and almost 57% of patients were in a complete response, this was a far better treatment response than we'd seen with any other agent, and showed really that IL-1 blockade was extremely effective um, in treating mavalonic kinase deficiency if we could get adequate dose in. It's not quite clear um, 
like anakinumab was better than we thought anakinra was, but one possible explanation for this is that because canakinumab is easier to give in higher doses, this in fact reflects the fact that in his mavalonic kinase deficiency, we do need to give a bigger dose of drug. Uh, and the cluster study, which I'm not going to overburden here, also showed that these patients did very well in terms of quality of life, but also the long-term IL-1 blockade uh, in all these patient groups and um, across the adverse event was extremely safe and well tolerated. Uh, so IL-1 blockade in um, mavalonic kinase deficiency as in TRAPS has been demonstrated um, in a phase three study to be an effective uh, and really very well tolerated treatment and is consequently the only licensed treatment for this. This is taken from a paper from this year, looking at the treatment options in mavalonic kinase deficiency from Eust Frankel's group. Again, makes the point that there's remarkably little data, that symptomatic relief during attacks should be used, and that as with the other periodic fever syndromes, non-steroidal agents are the treatment of choice. During acute flares, as always, we use steroids at a big-ish dose, and that there may be an argument for a brief course of anakinra. Treatment of chronic active disease, there may be a role for colchizine in milder disease, uh, fitting in with activation of the IL-1 inflammasome. Um, and anakinra um, and has been widely used, and canakinumab is the only treatment that's proven in randomized control studies. There have been a number of small retrospective case series that say in, in patients who don't do well with IL-1 blockade, etanercept or tocilizumab can be useful. There are other alternative treatments. Bone marrow transplantation has been used to salvage patients with very severe MVK. And we know that the enzyme is ubiquitously expressed, but we think that the phenotype is largely due to myeloid expression of the enzyme. And allogeneic bone marrow transplantation has been effective in a number of neonates with very severe disease. It's potentially curative, but there are upfront risks and one of the reported children died. So it is not to be undertaken lightly, um, but has been used, including in both London and Israel, to my knowledge in the last couple of years, in two children who presented with neonatal macrophage activation syndrome due to this disease. Gene therapy is very tempting with advances in CRISPR technology in terms of replacing the deficient gene. And there is also, in theory, uh, the possibility of altering isoprenoid synthesis and trying to increase flux down the isoprenoid pathway. Statins have been used, and there was interest um, uh, from a small study which suggested benefit, but a subsequent slightly larger study suggested absolutely no benefit. And potentially there could be squalene synthase inhibitors used, but these have not been used in clinical studies, uh, and we don't yet have any data about whether that would be useful or not. There have been generated share recommendations for the management of um, HIDS mavalonic kinase deficiency, which is pretty much what's saying here. Again, making the point that it's possible in these diseases to use on-demand anakinra just to treat short attacks. Um, and this is very widely used in the Netherlands where this is a common disease. And then finally, this again is just pointing out, this is again taken from the German consensus and they have produced another um, rather useful poster about how to manage this, which is very similar for traps. So finally, to finish, I'd say the key takeaways from this is that the inherited periodic fever syndromes are rare, genetically diverse, but clinically similar. They have potentially very severe complications of which lifelong AA amyloidosis is the most severe, but in pediatrics, really, it is uh, the severe symptom load associated with acute attacks and the effect on growth and development associated with chronic inflammation, which we most want to protect against. The goal of management is supportive treatment during attacks and prevention of, of future attacks, thereby preventing disease damage. The diseases have very different etiology, but the availability now of biologic treatments uh, means that for both these diseases, what we look for in the future is that with current medical treatment, our early diagnosis we think means that these patients should do very, very well in the long term. And it may be that in the future, gene therapy will mean that these diseases may become amenable to truly modern treatments and definitive treatment very early in life. And I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.
thanks so much uh, yeah thanks so much for that fantastic eye opening uh, talk and it's really uh, thought provoking as well and uh, there are lots of questions in the chat box uh, dr ashraf is going to think uh, do you have time uh, 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 okay gida dr ajay yeah. yes sir will you read that questions uh, yes sir we'll start from the beginning So there's a question from Dr. Naresh. So how can we differentiate traps from SLE, especially if the chronic variety? So classically, SLE shouldn't be associated with the raised acute face response. Um, so traps with disease activity, they should really have a sky high CRP. Um, so they really should look very different. Uh, and although you, in theory, can get coincidental autoinflammatory and autoimmune disease, we haven't actually seen it. So we really would expect them to be autoantibody negative in traps. Um, and the rashes for us look very different. Um, but I would be pretty suspicious of somebody who's labeled with SLE, who's running a CRP of a, in traps, we'd really be expecting to see CRPs really in the hundreds. Okay, uh, madam, there is a question from Dr. Raj Varya. Uh, I think it's regarding the study in the traps. Has procalcitonin and ferritin been measured in these children? Not that I'm aware of in the children. Um, we do measure ferritin from time to time and it's up, but appropriate to their CRP. So we tend to see ferritins in the hundreds. We don't see HLH levels of ferritin. Um, a number of these patients actually get a little bit iron deficient because they get a bit of an anemia of chronic disease. So eventually you can actually see them running a slightly low ferritin, probably because um, IL-1 slightly interferes with hepcidin and they end up being a little bit iron deficient. Um, procalcitonin, I'm not aware, has been measured very much. In the UK, procalcitonin is often not used very much in hospitals. So I've had one or two extremely good primary care colleagues uh, who have phoned me up and said, I'm sure it's an attack because I've measured their CRP and it's 90 milligrams per liter and their procalcitonin is normal. Um, but I've only got that experience from a couple of adult patients. I don't think anyone's done it systematically. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Amit. Is there any recommendations regarding screening for amyloidosis in these patients with auto-inflammatory syndrome using any abdominal fat aspiration rectal biopsy? or is there any pre-direction uh, pre in them to develop amyloidosis in the future? So it's a really good question. Um, so the risk of amyloidosis increases with age. Children do very occasionally get amyloidosis, but it is extremely rare. Um, so generally speaking, we're very reassuring about kids. 97% uh, of patients who have AA amyloidosis will have either significantly impaired renal function or significant proteinuria. So if they have normal renal function and a normal urine dipstick, you can be very, very reassured and that is cheap and easy. Abdominal fat aspirates are pretty good. The problem is that you have to rely on a negative abdominal fat aspirate. Um, it's useful if they've got a fairly large amyloid load you can have a negative abdominal fat aspirate in the presence of a small amyloid load. Uh, so it doesn't tell you that they haven't got a tiny bit of amyloid. Um, and rectal biopsies, again, it's useful if what you're saying is, I really think they've got amyloid and I want to find some and type it. But I wouldn't put a child through a screening biopsy to prove they haven't got amyloid. And to some extent, um, if they haven't got splenomegaly or and they haven't got proteinuria and their renal function is normal, I would just be reassured and I would just keep, I would essentially just dip their urine at every clinic visit. Uh, I think the, there's a question in continuation to it from the, Dr. Anju Gupta. How do you monitor for amyloidosis, especially in setting where serum amyloid A levels are not available? So it is really being aware of the risk, watching their renal function. Uh, and as long as they haven't got proteinuria and their renal function is rock steady, I would be reassured and I would simply monitor. Serum amyloid A protein is the precursor for AA amyloidosis. It doesn't tell you that they have AA amyloidosis. 
Serum amyloid A protein is a very good prognostic marker in patients who have AA amyloidosis, where we know that measuring the levels tells you the natural history of the AA amyloidosis and you want it suppressed. We think that if you have sustained very high levels of serum AA amyloid, that is a risk factor for developing AA amyloidosis. But nonetheless, the majority of patients who have it never develop AA amyloidosis. Probably only about 20% of patients at high risk ever develop it. And we don't really understand the risks for it. I wouldn't, I mean, we can measure it and I greatly value being able to measure it, but it's not the be all and the end all of monitoring these patients. There are very few patients where the CRP won't do it for you. So the vast majority of patients who have high levels of inflammation, you will pick it up on the CRP. There are a very small number of patients who run a CRP of less than 10, but their SAA is consistently above 50, but they are extraordinarily rare. And on the whole, if their CRP is normal, that will do for you. An SAA is particularly useful only in monitoring when you know they have amyloid. There's a question from uh, Ms. Aishirya. Uh, what determines the risk of amyloidosis? Is there any genotype correlation with, with which is going to predict the severity? So I wish I knew. Unlike in FMF, there is not a known genotype correlation in either in um, TRAPS that does it. Um, in mavalonic kinase defi deficiency, there is a reported genotype correlation, but I don't really believe it because I think it's just chance. Um, so family history is a strong risk factor and you need to be very, very wary of a kindred in which there is AA amyloidosis uh, because there the risk is high. Uh, length of uncontrolled inflammation is a risk factor. And beyond that, we don't really know. Um, so it is remarkably unclear to us why some people get AA amyloidosis and some people don't. Um, and I wish I could answer that question. I've wasted 20 years of my life and I can't answer it. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Amit. Uh, Madam, you're told uh, anti-TNFs are not much effective in traps. So is there any specific mechanism behind it? probably that it's just the wrong pathway. I mean, it just seems so tempting that if the mutations are in the TNF receptor, that the TNF pathway must be involved. But in fact, we think that the variant protein never makes it to the cell surface. And therefore there is no TNF signaling in this disease pathogenesis. In fact, it's a misfolded protein response. And it doesn't matter that the misfolded protein is a TNF receptor because it never gets to do its normal function. Um, and this is very IL-1 specific. Uh, and there's a question from Dr. Gida. What is the reason for the recurrent infections in uh, HIDs, HIDs? Um, not entirely clear. So it's a clinical observation that in general, in auto-inflammatory diseases, these children in particular seem to be super immune competent. So a classic feature of the history is that whether it's PFAPA or FMF or TRAPS or even CAPS, that these kids tend not to get minor infections. But that is not the case with mavalonic kinase deficiency where the kids often get minor infections and they often precipitate attacks. And so it's meant that whereas we were very confident when it came to starting biologics in TRAPS and CAPS and colchicine resistant FMF that they were really weren't particularly at risk of infection we were a bit more worried in mavalonic kinase deficiency. And there are one or two anecdotal case reports of children getting overwhelming bacterial infection. But quite what the difference is at a mechanistic level is really not clear. Certainly not to me. Uh, it's a question, ma'am. Uh, what is the risk for amyloidosis greater in hits or traps? Seems to be much greater in traps. So it's probably about five-fold higher in traps. Um, and again, the reasons aren't entirely clear. Um, and curious enough, it's even higher in FMF, where untreated uh, FMF seemed to have a risk that was as high as 60%. Um, again, there's a question from uh, Dr. Amit. Uh, what is the cause of increased incidence of macrophage activation syndrome in HEATS compared to other periodic peak fevers? Is there any, uh, because is it due to any HLH associated genes polymorphism? It's a very good question. And again, we don't know. 
there is no known linkage with other HLH associated genes. So that it's not a gene linkage effect. It does seem to be a genuine disease pathology effect, but we don't understand it. There are, to my knowledge, three patients in the world with traps who've had HLH and that's it. We've never seen it in caps. Um, but why we see this with particularly severe avalonic kinase deficiencies um, and not with the others, we don't know. Madam, there is a question again from Dr. Geeta Rajan, madam. Uh, so when macrophage activation syndrome occurs in heads, so how do we manage with steroids only? How do you, what do you suggest? So these children have been remarkably sick and have not really been manageable with steroids only. So the ones who I've been peripherally involved with are uh, because they have been too young for me and too sick have been managed in neonatal ITU settings on really very high doses of amakinra and steroids and sometimes etoposide and stabilized with a view to early bone marrow transplantation. And so the recent cases have had uh, salvage bone marrow transplantation um, and have done very well. But these children, I think without that um, will do very badly indeed. I think presenting with neonatal HLH due to a metabolic defect requires aggressive definitive treatment. And the trick has been very skilled management in actually keeping them controlled until they're big enough that they can have a relatively safe transplant procedure. Uh, okay, madam. Uh, actually, there are a few more questions. So, uh, but uh, would you like to take these questions now? Oh. It's just, no, I'm fine. It's, it's, it's the middle of the day for me. It's, I'm keeping you up. Uh, give them, oh, shall we go? Yeah. Um, Professor Lackman, would you have time for a couple of more questions? Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, madam, uh, do we use the same criteria which we use for SOGIA uh, for diagnosing mass and, uh, and diagnosing mass in hits? Yes. I think that's very reasonable. And uh, what's the role of uh, SAA in monitoring patients with auto-inflammatory disease? That is, I think you had said it. Yeah, I think it, I, I really don't, it's nice if you've got it, but essentially serum amyloid A compared to CRP, it's just on a longer piece of string. So the higher, it, it goes higher, but if, if you are comfortable that in your particular patient, you know that when their CRP is normal, that they are fine. You don't need to measure anything else. What I would say is that the lesson from auto-inflammatory disease is that we do expect these values to be properly normal. We treat these children to run normal aged matched values. So we don't accept a CRP of 10. They should, mat they should run a CRP that you would expect to see in a healthy aged matched child. So we're looking for CRPs of less than one in our patients and not saying uh, tenfold higher is okay. Um, so you, we treat pretty much for perfection, but you can do that with the biomarkers you've got that are available. SAA is not necessary. You can use the available biomarker and it's just as good or nearly as good. And there's a question from uh, Dr. Anju. If we cannot predict the risk of amyloid, how do we decide on treatment protocol, protocol for traps that is between intermittent and continuous therapy? So it's a very good question. Um, I think the answer is that you have to choose your treatment and then monitor the effect. So our experience in traps has been that the majority of patients will not tolerate intermittent treatment because they are genuinely very active. And when you stop the intermittent treatment, they will promptly fill out again. The risk with traps is particularly in older patients who have had years and years of, treat of untreated disease is that essentially they are too brave. They have got used to what they regard as normal and they don't complain about it. Uh, they've often had quite a lot of feedback as have their parents about being a child who with a low pain threshold who is tired all the time and they feel that their life experience is normal and they don't complain about it. So my problem is that I have people coming going, I'm fine, I'm just a bit tired and their blood tests are terrible. And then you treat them and they go, I didn't know I was meant to feel like this. Is this how normal people feel? And you realize that they've been lying to you about their symptoms 
because they've been minimizing them because they didn't realize that normal is not feeling tired and achy all the time. So you have to monitor their symptoms against their acute phase response, make sure they're both normal. And then if you stop treatment, you have to keep monitoring it and make sure that things aren't going off again. Uh, generally speaking, once um, people know what normal is, they don't tolerate flares any better than you or I would. So once you have got people well, uh, they do tend to tell you when they're not well quite quickly. Uh, but the initial uh, treatment of people, they can be quite resistant to um, starting treatment because they feel they're better than they actually are. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Gita, madam. Is there, uh, does the inflammation starts antenatally in uh, HIDS? I don't know that anyone's looked at that. Um, it certainly starts very early, um, but I'm not aware. I'm just trying to think. So anecdotally, our CAPS babies frequently are admitted to SCABU because as they are born, they are clearly rashy um, and there is concern that they have got um, a neonatal infection. And I'm trying to talk everybody down from giving them lump punches and saying this is certainly caps. I don't think we see that very often with our HIDS babies. So there are some of them with very, very severe disease are triggering an immediate metabolic pathway analysis because this is clearly a very, very sick baby. But the rest of them tend to be presenting at three or four months with what looks like infections. Um, but I don't think I just don't think anyone's really taken antenatal bloods and said this is an inflamed looking um, neonatal fetus. So I'm not sure. I think that's absence of data. I'm not sure I can answer that question. Uh, madam, uh, it's a question by Dr. Suma, madam. Uh, what are the options to interleukin-1 inhibitors, thyridomide, JAK inhibitors? What are the options? So... It's very difficult if you can't get IL-1 inhibitors because all the options are very unattractive. So thalidomide, I think, is better at blocking IL-6. That's probably plausibly what it does. We, many years ago, gave thalidomide to, with, to somebody with CAPS, and it was better than nothing, uh, but he got a peripheral neuropathy. Um, so we had to stop it. Um, I don't think the jacks are very attractive. I don't think you're going to get very far with blocking interferon. Um, you know, colchazine is probably the best we've got. And colchazine will block the IL-1 pathway. But the problem is that you um, have a difficulty with how much you can achieve in vitro um, against in, um, in vivo, rather, against in vitro and you probably can't achieve big enough doses. The difficulty is that there are really good agents and they're not that expensive and there isn't anything that really matches them. And it's incredibly frustrating if you can't offer them uh, because the choice is between high dose steroids with all the associated toxicity or nothing or the drugs that you know are safe and work. And Hi, Ellen Kishore here. I'm really sorry to jump in. To get no, I, things into perspective, there is absolutely no access to anti-IL-1 in India, which I, I guess is the frustration of um, everyone who is attending. So maybe uh, time for us to maybe do some um, canvassing or um, lobbying um, in, the, in the concerned with the concerned parties to say whether it's can done. I think um, the bed, the whole idea of this auto-inflammatory series also has been to kind of improve the awareness and to to kind of um, enhance a push um, in case we could um, uh, get these companies to be kinder and make IL-1, anti-IL-1 available in India, which I would, would I think would change things dramatically um, uh, in the landscape of uh, auto-inflammation uh, in a big country like India. I mean, I completely agree. And I, the difficulty is there is, it is, you know, morally so black and white. Um, because they are so well tolerated and so effective and actually not that expensive for the drug companies to make. 
Yeah, we are really grateful to Dr. Kishore for helping us organizing this series. He's been a godsend for us. So thank you so much, Dr. Kishore. You've been here all along. You're actually one of us. Thank you so much. Um, shall we, are there any more questions in the chat box? Um, uh, yes. One more question from Raj Varya. Uh, one last yes. question. Yeah, one last question from Dr. Raj Varya. So in case of giving steroids, what is the risk of missing an occult malignancy and masking it by giving steroids? So I think that's something that we all really, really worry about. I certainly worry about it in PUOs in the older patients. Um, in truth, although in theory it can happen, and we certainly worry about it with the presentations of HLH in adults, PUO presenting as a malignancy runs on the whole a very aggressive and unpleasant course. So our adult data suggests that if they have not manifested what is usually a lymphoma or an adenocarcinoma within two months, and on the whole, your diagnostic workup still going on after two months, they're probably not going to. Um, so I think one has to be cognizant of it and you have to take a careful history and carefully examine your patient. Um, but we probably all of us spend more anxiety over it um, than, um, and that's appropriate because you don't want to miss it, but it really doesn't happen very often. And my experience is that you find the malignancies fairly straightforwardly because your patient is starting to look extremely horrible quite fast. Um, and these patients give you a very long history and just aren't changing very much. Uh, so one of the classic features of these diseases is that you see them in a flare and you think they are going to die. Um, and then a week later, they look fine. Um, and that just doesn't happen if you've got, if you've got somebody presenting in a PUO with a lymphoma. A week later, they look a lot worse. Professor Rajwarya, it's an absolute pleasure having you join us from the US. Professor Rajwarya is a reputed hemato-oncologist in the United States. For concluding remarks, can we have uh, Dr. Vinod's career? Dr. Vinod, please. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Lachman for the wonderful and insightful talk. And uh, yeah, this has uh, really added value in diagnosing more cases of HITS uh, because HITS is uh, quite prevalent in at least Kerala, uh, as we know, uh, not, not so across the country, but at least in Kerala and South India, it is pretty much prevalent. So the insights have been really, really useful. And I believe a lot of participants would now start recognizing patients who come with uh, autoinflammatory conditions and diagnose them and treat them better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you. Ajit, Dr. Ajit for the vote of thanks. Dr. Ajit. Oh, thank you, Dr. Helen, for the excellent talk. And uh, you have greatly because generated interest in all of, the, all of them, especially even seeing the questions. And you answered it very well for, and uh, and we, we at uh, Calicut Medical College, for your information, we are a nodal center for primary immunodeficiency. And we are uh, doing uh, all the investigations free of cost, especially to, uh, to the northern part of our state. And uh, Dr. Geetha uh, is our uh, nodal officer and uh, for primary immunodeficiencies. And uh, I think we can have a good collaboration with uh, UCL and uh, if possible. And uh, right. I think that this uh, this collaborate this can continue. Uh, we can we may not we can uh, continue from this talk, and uh, we have a lot of auto implemented And Gida has uh, done some work on hits uh, in Chile, along with Vinod's career. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your excellent talk, and it has and in this rare this is it has generated a lot of uh, a lot of concern as well as uh, interest. And so that uh, one question for you is uh, whether 
like traps usually the fever is more than 7 days i mean even though i i want to thank you but our question is whether if it is less than 7 days whether we can exclude uh, traps or something no usually that's uh, you, if it is more than 7 days usually traps are there Yes, what, so yeah. if it's more than seven days, it's probably traps. But if it's less yeah. than seven days, it can still be traps. Okay, it need it can also be traps. Okay, yes. thank you very much, and uh, all the teachers on the all the senior pediatricians, especially C uh, K sir, all the uh, Sri Gumar sir, Rajwar sir. Say uh, I to Rajwar sir, he is one of our favorite teachers. And uh, so, so thank you very much, all the audience, all the all those who participated, and. Uh, and big uh, happy diwali to all of you we have uh, deepavali coming tomorrow yeah. okay thank you very much so uh, i think we'll uh, stay connected to ucl one of our student is there in ucl doing pediatric hematology dr neelu marpotra now great talk dr lakshman wonderful talk thank you very much thank you thank you that that's well sir thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you very so much. much thank you Thank you for the invitation. Good evening to you and good night for all, all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone. See you next Friday. Good night. Night. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.